Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Executive Editor of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining today's Dataversity webinar, Best Practices in Data Stewardship. It is the latest installment in a monthly series called Data Ed Online with Dr. Peter Aiken, brought to you in partnership with Data Blueprint. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. If you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the upper right-hand corner for that feature. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag data ed. To answer the most commonly asked questions, as always, we will send a follow-up email to all registrants within two business days containing links to the slides. And yes, we are recording and will likewise send a link to the recording of this session as well as any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speakers for today. Peter Aiken is an internationally recognized data management thought leader. Many of you already know him or have seen him at conferences worldwide, especially Dataversity conferences. He has more than 30 years of experience and has received many awards for his outstanding contributions to the profession. Peter is also the founding director of Data Blueprint. He has written dozens of articles and books. The most recent is Monetizing Data Management, although that's about to change. Um, Peter, is experience, your book's coming out in January? We hope so. Everything's on track. Thanks, Shannon. <laughs> and Peter is experienced with more than 500 data management practices in 20 countries and consistently named as a top data management expert. Some of the most important and largest organizations in the world have sought out his data his and Data Blueprint's expertise. Peter has spent multi-year immersions with groups as diverse as the U.S. Department of Defense, Deutsche Bank, Nokia, Wells Fargo, the Commonwealth of Virginia, and Walmart. He often appears at conferences and is constantly traveling. Peter, where are you today? We're actually at uh, Data Blueprint World Headquarters in Richmond, Virginia, a beautiful day here on the East Coast. Hopefully the voting will be seamless and uh, effortless for everybody. And, uh, Hopefully you're not listening to this at the expense of voting for something important like the President of the United States. But aside from that, yes, we're, we're here, and I'm here with my colleague, Mike Ogilvy. Uh, Mike has got 15 years in the business here, uh, very deep architectural experience in warehousing, integration, and data quality. And we were just talking before we got started about, you know, how that is actually, how much of that has to be education into the customer base. And that's one of the things we all find out in this area is that if you can explain a problem, you're probably halfway to solving the problem. So, Mike, great to have you here. Mike has a BS in physics and a focus in here specifically on data governance, stewardship, quality, and requirement consulting. And we're going to talk for the next hour or so about uh, best practices in data stewardship. And the, the real key to this is that, I don't did you come up with that line? With great data comes great responsibility? Or maybe that was uh, Dylan that came up. That wasn't me. No, that okay. was someone else. <laughs> we know, we, we know, it's a group effort, so we never <laughs> find out where these things come from. But it, we like it because uh, it is a, a set of responsibilities here that we're going to look at. So we're going to look specifically at, as we always do, a data management overview. We'll talk about the business needs for stewardship. We'll talk about some principles that are involved in it, and then we'll look at how to pull those together to give everybody that's participating some opportunities to foster a data-driven culture. And Shannon was hinting at the uh, the data strategy book that this partly coming out of, and we're partly pulling some of the next uh, seminar out on this one too. Uh, just to give you a preview on that one, the next one is called Exercising the Seven Deadly Data Sins. Ooh, we probably should have done that around Halloween, but hey, what the heck. <laughs> uh, exactly, and writing schedules never match up with everything that you'd like to have them done. So I'll take the first chunk of this and, and just sort of give a quick run through and background for everybody on what is data management. Most people, sort of define data management or what happens between the two important points in a piece of data's life. Uh, that is when it is first acquired and then when it is used. Uh, we come up with some definitions like understanding the current and future data needs, blah, blah, blah. What it does come down to though is in order to have data that is sourced and used, uh, we have to do a couple of things. We have to engineer the data, we have to store the data, we have to deliver the data. And what that means is we need a process that we call governance. And we'll get to a little bit of rationale on why governance is important in just a bit. But this also means that you need to have some specialized team skills in effect, because if people don't know what they're doing, uh, you don't tend to get very good results uh, on all of this. There's a problem, however, and we, we actually put this out there as a challenge to the community uh, 
each and every time we do this because this doesn't well represent the real value of data that it needs not just to be used but to be reused. And so we've been moving towards more of a definition that looks a little bit like this, which is to say that the reuse part is the part that we're going to focus on, the idea that data is not a production function. And we're going to write an article in the near future called Data is Not the New Oil uh, on this. And to say the specialized team skills should really be focusing on delivering our sole non-depletable, non-degradable, durable strategic asset to a variety of business needs and then examining how those business needs are met by the data so that we can improve the overall business practice. It is def definitely not a strict storage skill. The real challenge though, and again, Andrina and I were just talking about this right before, is that most people don't kind of get how this works. And I, I put that blame directly on the college and university system. Uh, which tends to focus in on the fun stuff. Now, the fun stuff we'll define as roughly the stuff that's in the golden triangle here. Uh, and of course, you've all heard this, uh, master data management, data mining, big data analytics. Uh, these are all great buzzwords that turn into be largely technology focused. And I, I say that because the top of this pyramid here is very much like the tip of the iceberg or the top of the Maslow hierarchy of needs that you can see in the upper right-hand corner there. If you remember Maslow, Maslow says that if your food, clothing, and shelter needs are unmet, you cannot move to the next level in this case. Uh, again, you can see it's safety and then the belonging, uh, esteem, and then self-actualization is the five levels of that. And if your food, clothing, and shelter needs are unmet, you are unlikely to ever achieve self-esteem. In fact, according to Maslow, you simply cannot do it. And we believe the same thing here. If you want to try these things in the golden triangle, you'll do a much better job if you first learn the basics. Uh, and again, that may be, uh, you know, the idea that you're going to have to understand governance, quality, data management, strategy, operations, platform, and architecture at a good level before you can try to do the things that are really fun in order to do this. Notice again that the top is a focus on technology and the bottom half is really focused on capabilities. One other thing that's important for this diagram is that the foundation of any foundational piece is only as strong as the weakest link in this instance. So if I had made a foundation out of marshmallow, I probably wouldn't want to make it 10 stories high. It's just not going to work. And of course, I'm using an extreme example there just to drive the point home. But knowing that the foundation is only as strong as the weakest link is actually kind of key because in the instance that I'm showing here, the weak link is clearly between data management strategy and data platform and architecture. And data platform and architecture needs to be made stronger part of that foundation because you could put more effort into governance, quality, strategy, and operations, and it won't help the overall strength of that platform because the weak link is over on the data architecture platform. At Data Blueprint, we get a lot of questions, and people say, yeah, I hear you say that, Peter, but I still need it done by Friday. Uh, can you do it by Friday? And the answer is yes, absolutely. But if we do it, it will take longer. It will cost more. It will deliver less, and it will present greater risk to the organization than if instead you learn to crawl, walk, and run. Watch this next transition, everybody. See, all those pieces actually go up into this thing now, which is something that my colleague Melanie Mecca uh, and I have been talking about for a couple of years. It's a relatively new development. It's a CMM for data management. If that doesn't mean anything to you, it's a capability maturity model. But the nice thing is that your boss knows CMM. We've done a great job, and Carnegie Mellon has done a great job of propagating their process improvement process. And this process improvement process is now applicable to the data world here as well. So those five pieces that I showed you in the previous slide that were foundational now mean that we should manage the data coherently. Most organizations' data is managed very well at the work group level, but not so well when you try to get all the work groups to move in the same direction at the same time. That's the definition of strategy. That governance, there is a professional class of individuals, as you'll see from the presentation today, that we can now call upon to do good professional quality work, that we can determine whether data is in fact fit for use, whether we are approaching data with the right technology and the right set of processes uh, around it. These make big differences, and we can now start to work within that context and see it. So what you see here between the iceberg slide and this one is a way of improving the foundational practices around it. And one last piece of sort of background here is the DEMA, Data Management Body of Knowledge, 
somebody with a marketing background, please help us. We keep naming things badly. We named this after the PMBOK, the Project Institute Management Body of Knowledge. They did a great job on it, and 20 years ago, somebody may or may not have known what a project manager is, but everybody, thanks to their efforts, now knows if you are a project manager, you probably have to have the certification in place. And they called theirs the PMBOK, so we called ours the DIMBOK. Boom, okay. Anyway, the point here is that we've, for the first time, and I say the first time, all these things have come about since the year 2009, so it's relatively new, but that we now can look and see what it means to be data management, each of these 10 pieces of the pie that we have, although one circled at the center is data governance, which we're going to focus in on today, and that each of these need to be done in a way that we can improve the process. Uh, before we leave the dim box here, we're going to look at just the overview input process output diagram, the IPO diagram for the DIMBOK. This is from page one of it, uh, but what you see here is that these are the inputs that go into governance. Of course, we're going to dive into a subsection of this today. Let's go ahead and do it. Business needs for data steward. And again, Mike, I think this is where you jump right in. Oh, that, that sounds good. So the question becomes, what happens with the data and why is it a challenge? <clears throat> Why does data get into an unmanaged state? I think um, the unmanageability is not just something that happens sometimes. I think a, a lot of people, particularly some clients, you know, we've dealt with, feel like it's it's an oddity that they've gotten into this state, uh, and it's really uh, what I consider to be tantamount to a fundamental law of nature. <laughs> That's just the way it happens. As an organization grows, the data becomes unmanaged and difficult because attention is being paid elsewhere. There are probably a few rare cases where people have. Uh, done an early adoption of data management strategies early in the life cycle, but 99% of the time, the need and foresight for a unified organizational outlook about data uh, is only dealt with once pain points have come in. So data is naturally goes into an unmanaged state. So in the current state, you have little ability to communicate uh, about the data. Uh, there's unknowable documentation and data inconsistencies. Where you're trying to get to is a managed state of data. In an ideal state, the goal you're going for is a unified organization of data. Data is an asset with known ownership. The names and language of the data is consistent, so everyone is on the same page. And the data and metadata are meaningful across the organization. There's good uses of the data that, that um, Good usage of the data cannot be achieved if the data doesn't mean anything to anyone. Data has to work at that most granular level in order to be correct, which is the most detailed, and that turns out to be the hardest. And a lot of people don't understand that that is the hardest part of the problem. Right. Uh, data is a, a lot. The reality is that uh, there's a lot of it, and it's not easy to manage, but it is an asset. Uh, and I believe Peter always says it best. I can't always replicate it as good as he can, but uh, it's, uh, it's the organization's most endurable asset, uh, not endur durable asset, and uh, it has to be maintained. So you need data governance around it. So you look at governance, and we have a lot of definitions about governance that has been evolving over the past couple of uh, decades, really. Uh, we used to call this data administration. If you go back old enough, it seemed like a, a natural thing. We started calling it data governance more recently. And there's a couple of definitions up here from uh, Dama and a couple of colleagues. First one is the exercise of authority controlled shared decision making, planning, monitoring, and enforcement over the management of data assets. Okay, that's a, a reasonable one. I have to say it's a good one because it's Dama and I was president of Dama for a couple of years. So, yeah. Uh, our good friend Rob Siner, from uh, which we grabbed a couple of uh, uh, key definitions in this presentation, and, and Rob is the editor of TDAN, uh, which is also out on the Dataversity uh, website there, calls it the exercise and enforcement of decision-making authority over the management of data assets and the performance of data functions. Uh, then my colleague Steve Adler, uh, who we were both at a White House function just a couple of weeks back, uh, we still joke uh, about a, a debate we had a long time ago about whether data is an asset or not uh, on there. But he says it's coordinating communication to achieve common goals among collaboration. Uh, Mike, was this your definition here? That was that was not mine either, but I, I like that one. Yeah, custody battle over data instead of kids. All right, we're kidding on that one, but we don't want people to actually think that it's a 
esoteric thing, and really the definition is going to be personal to your organization. The simplest definition, the one that we like the best, is that we talk about data as being managing data with guidance. And when you say that, the real aha moment comes from management who says, oh, so if we're not doing data governance, we are managing data without guidance. And that's exactly where you started the story, isn't it, Mike? Right. Uh, that's, where, that's where you usually, you've already been. That's why you've gotten to the pain point where you're starting to consider governance. Uh, ideally, you'll think about it ahead of time, but that's not the majority of cases. Uh, so, um, so in practical terms, this you threw me on that one. Sorry about that. I got you off script there. <laughs> right, you got me. You got, you got me. A, it's a, it's just a little separate order than I was expecting it to. Uh, data governance is defining how data should be managed within an organization. Uh, and this includes the designated people who are responsible for the stewardship of the data and the governance rules that have been defined. This includes a lot of things like data capturing, data quality, uh, policies and procedures, uh, and the management of the process. Sorry about mixing the slides up on you there. Yeah, the key for that is to understand that if we're doing it without guidance, things happen the way individuals think is best. But unfortunately, you can't win a war by every soldier going off and thinking what they're doing is the best thing on that because it adds to what we call a cascading effect. And we're going to throw this into the context of quality, although it works in almost any aspect of systems development. We are people and we make errors. And when we make errors, if we don't catch those errors, those errors propagate through the rest of the system. So I'm dividing this one up here into requirements, and there'll be some errors. I'm not suggesting they're 50%, but I'm also guaranteeing you that whatever we do is not 100% perfect. And then I move to the next stage. Now, remember, requirements is about specifying what, and designing is about specifying how. So now I've gone done some what stuff, and now I'm going to done and say how to do it. Okay, well, the how to do it then, right, turns out to also have some errors in it, but if I don't catch the errors in the what in the first place, I'm going to do how correctly for the wrong what. And I hope that makes sense to everybody. If it doesn't ask us questions when we get to the break, because I'm going to build the rest of the slide here for you and say that what much of IT systems development is about is trying to minimize the amount of red on these diagrams. And each one of these blocks doesn't represent a percentage, but it represents a category of errors that are occurring into here. And the real interesting part about this is that while we get this piece going, we then go and study and say, how much does it cost? Well, it turns out, Mike, if you had given me a set of specifications early on and it cost us a penny to fix those errors during the requirement stage, if I didn't catch them until design, it would cost 50 cents. If I caught them at the coding stage, it would cost me a dollar, a hundred times more at the implementation stage than it would at the requirement stage. If I didn't get them till the testing stage, it would be 200%. If I got them to the acceptance of it, this is, does this fit? Right. We're handing it to the customer at that point. It's 500 times. And in the maintenance phase, it's $20 to fix that one penny error because of those cascading effects, <clears throat> all of the complexity, et cetera, et cetera, right. in there. It's just like compound interest, except wrong direction. Wrong direction, great. It's, it's, it's always, I mean, it's so intuitive to think about it that way, but when you really see the, the comparisons right next to each other, it's, uh, it really hits home visually. And our measurements show that we only detect 50% of the problems during the maintenance phase, which is why maintenance is 80% of the expenditure that we do on IT and all of that. So let's look now at some principles relative to that. This is a kind of a complicated diagram. We don't want to blow you guys out of the water with this, but this is the kind of explanation that often is tried to be imparted to people. Now, the, the goal of the slide here is really to talk about different aspects or different focuses on how the governance is done. So the first model that we put up here, and again, very, very tiny type. Don't try and read this. That's not the issue. Um, we're giving this to you as a reference piece, and you can go back and look at it later on, but a totally decentralized model. Again, the things that Mike was describing, the proper term for that is entropy. Things happen because it seems natural. People are trying to do the best things, and they have a good uh, 
intuition as to the way it should be done, different backgrounds that would come along. Uh, Mike, again, your background as a physicist is going to give you a very different perspective than somebody else who's coming at this from an organic chemistry perspective, even though you're both coming from the science community uh, on that sort of thing. By the way, in case you guys can't tell, I like people with lots of backgrounds. Yes. Right? It's <laughs> generally a good thing in data to bring them in that way. Uh, and they're so we get to the next model then, and the, this model is a federated model. And the idea here is that we're going to have some cooperation that occurs between different parts of the organization. There's sort of a little bit of top down, but you can see also there is some side to side communication in this instance here as well. Then there's a centralized hybrid mode, which says, okay, for these things, we're going to keep these things centralized. Maybe, for example, our, our easy way to conceptualize this is our definition of customer will be used throughout the entire organization. But your definition of vendor might apply differently because different countries have different uh, ways they implement vendor in there. And of course, the, the extreme example of this is totally centralized. Uh, you know, again, highly dictatorial. Uh, some companies are very good at implementing this. Some companies are not. Uh, now, Again, we show you this to show you the range of the way things can occur. And your organization might hypothetically be somewhere between decentralized and federated, and that your roadmap says what we'd really like to get to is over here. Uh, the point here is to understand that none of this occurs quickly. It can take a long time to do this, and that the people who are going to be doing this kind of work are the people who you need to have making sure that stewardship is an important part of what they're doing. So when we look at this in practical terms, everybody shares the data that goes around back and forth, and we're trying to identify the specific data elements and stewards that are there. Uh, Mike, you and I run into this all the time when somebody will say, well, I've got SharePoint, and we both kind of go, oh, sorry about that. <laughs> right. By the way, SharePoint is fine software. We're not making fun of that. But SharePoint, without the governance structure around it, becomes a very unwieldy project right. and basically a place for everybody's old slides to go. Right, yeah, you have that issue. Then you have the, the federation of dozens and dozens of spreadsheets spread throughout the company, and uh, uh, those kinds of problems make data governance much more complicated. Which really says if you have SharePoint, you need to have a steward for doing SharePoint uh, in order to do this. So again, SharePoint is one of the many things that you can use to, to do this. Calibra is a, another uh, terrific set of technologies to look at from a data governance perspective. Then we have a subset of everybody that becomes the data stewardship committee. And what they're doing is they're trying to get ownership of a component of the business. Again, it might be manufacturing, it might be uh, production, it might be sales, different ways of dividing up the business, and that these business data stewards represent a function in there that works as they can to keep things in play and keep things running and keep things running smoother. Now, again, remember back to where Mike started this off. You thought you had a great plan and everything was wonderful, and then you were successful, and all of a sudden you had a lot more than you thought. You didn't have time to keep everything as neat as you did. Uh, so entropy sets in, and we have a, a sort of a mess on this. Well. Can we make things better? And that's really what it's about, is trying to make things better in that type of a, a context. The stewardship committee is going to have a relationship with a group of people that are the data stewards. And they're going to be specifically, and it's a little bit misnomer to say define data elements, because what we're really trying to do is to make a formal definition, but we're not doing this in an abstract sense. We're saying we are using this field for the following pieces. One of my favorite examples of this was a health system we worked with recently that had a field that was very clearly labeled admit date. Okay. It's pretty easy. And there's a data dictionary that said this is the date somebody is admitted to the health system. Well, they went around in practice and found that the, the stewards did an investigation found 12 different uses of this. Now, that was in and of itself interesting, but the cost of that alternate series of uses was millions of dollars a year for the health system. So it wasn't just that we're not using it the same way. It's that not using it the same way costs us money. Right. And that becomes an important drive. Yeah, and I think probably everyone on the call has had the experience of having a data field that is being used in a way that was it wasn't originally intended for. And quite possibly being used in a way 180 degrees different from what it was intended, originally intended to be used for. Uh, that is uh, just very common. 
that's the benefit of us, of course, being consultants is that we see a lot of different things, and this is where you learn this. Whereas if you've only done in one area, you tend not to have that bigger perspective on all that. Right, and I think one important thing about when it says define data elements, which you were getting to, is that it's not about the data not having existed before, and it's not about the data steward being in a role of saying, well, we've never recorded uh, admit date before, we need to start recording that. That's maybe tangentially related to it, but that's not really the, the main goal. The main goal is that that data is already there and the data stewards are there uh, along with data governance uh, system to make sure that it's being uh, maintained and controlled in a way that the business can use. Because if we don't, it costs us millions, right? right? And that's the part that we're all practicing to get better at. Uh, doing this. And this really is the definition of the team. The governance team pulls together all of this activity in a way that helps the organization manage better its sole non-depleting, non-degrading, durable strategic asset. I've only been saying that five years. That's why I think <laughs> right, yeah. I rolled right. up your tongue a lot easier than that. Exactly. A lot of practice on that. This is where it gets into um, uh, to the real heart of our presentation here. We're talking about the data steward. So as into the original definition of, you know, how, when we define data governance, that uh, the data stewardship is really, it's operational. Uh, it's, uh, I like to say it's where the rubber meets the road. It's facilitating the everyday operation of the rules and structures defined by the data governance program. Uh, in addition to the pure management of those governance guidelines, they commonly end up having the most knowledge about the data and how to extract knowledge. Uh, a steward gives formalized structure to the tasks that had previously been unformalized. Going too fast. <laughs> so the real key there is that, as you said, formalize a struct an activity that was unstructured before, right. in a way that was a little bit looser defined, and that's what we're trying to get away from. Yes. The other part of it is, of course we need to have some training around it. We can't just grab anybody off the street and say, hey, you look like a data steward, get over there. Oh, that's a great picture of a data steward there. I love that. I looked for a long time for that one. and That's a super one, right? Right. Well, the one I was talking about before, which I, uh, I kind of like, I don't know, it's a little off the beaten path a little bit, but I couldn't find a good image of it. I always think, uh, in my mind, when I'm thinking about data stewardship, is uh, the, the handlers you see at a theme park, and you see the uh, dressed up uh, uh, characters in costumes. Mm -hmm. There's always a handler along with them yeah. that is, uh, in some respects, their job is to protect that uh, from the three-year-olds kicking them in the shins and uh, from the teenagers making fun of them. And in some respects, it's to make sure that they are heading in the right direction and being presented to the public because those characters are a valuable asset uh, and they're taking care of them. So that's a, the kind of off-the-beaten-path image that I like to think of when I think of a steward. And if anybody has any images of that, we did search the Internet for those images right. and just we couldn't find them. There was a couple. They were surprisingly hard to, uh, <laughs> to find some good images on that one. Absolutely. So a couple slides here on a stewardship position that we pulled out of an email just from two days ago. Uh, so this is a company that wants to have somebody mid-career, two years of experience as a steward. Now, I'm not going to read this to you at all. You have them that you can take a look at. But notice a master's degree or an MBA is a plus. So they're trying to find somebody that's got eight to ten years experience querying data, identifying anomalies, gaps et cetera, et cetera, on this. Again, a lot of essential functions in here. If you look at the one I've highlighted in blue, though, performs data analysis for various enterprise-wide quality initiatives, Heck, that's a full-time job right there. I don't know where they're going to find time to do any of the rest of this stuff right. on here. And look at the background in here. Physics somehow doesn't show up in here. Uh, I'm no. not sure. It needs to be in there. I, I'd actually, I really <laughs> believe that, that very strongly because I think if you grow up strictly in an IT environment, you tend not to think of the rest of the world as much. And so, yeah, I agree with you 100% on that. Finally, I like this last piece. These are all from the same job description. May be required to sit and review information on a computer screen for long periods of time. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So what's it like to be a steward? What is it that you have to have? Uh, becoming a steward, let me see. Uh, no, right, so a specific background is not, uh, and data is not necessarily required. Uh, a steward is a, is a role that's related to the organizational data. It's not necessarily a position unto itself. It's more of a role-based uh, thing. So in some cases, it can be uh, a specific position where that is the entirety of that position, but uh, uh, not always. There are um, multiple types of stewards depending on the specific uh, 
uh, responsibilities. Uh, but ideally, uh, you do have someone dedicated to that role. And the title is not important. As we all know, the uh, different companies have completely different title structures. And I think uh, in that job posting we just had up, I don't think we saw the word steward in there uh, anywhere. It did talk about data governance. Uh, so it's not always uh, as common a term nowadays. And, and more importantly within a company, you know, steward can mean different things. I think, Peter, you were saying that in Europe, steward means something very different than it does here in America. They expect you to serve wine and cheese. Right. right. So it's important not to get hung up on the word and the title of what that might be. Uh, and I don't know as much about the, uh, the state of data stewardship certification. We're making uh, progress. Right. Um, and there are different types of data stewards, which we're about to get into, that uh, that take care of different responsibilities within the organization. And as you said before, also, it is uh, trying to get some training in place that works on formalizing that specific accountability. Right. It, it is something that's not uh, necessarily part of the mainstream, so some training around uh, what that really means is key. So there are a couple of different types of basic, what we call uh, data steward types. The business data steward. Um, manages the business elements of the data, data definitions, data quality programs, that sort of thing. A technical data steward uh, is focused on the technical, of course, systems and models, code, data architecture. Wait a minute, are you telling me that the business technology doesn't use the same vocabulary, that the, there's a difference there? Not anywhere I've been. <laughs> <laughs> We're laughing, sorry. The Good luck at that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. In, uh, in the column, it's X124075, and you're going, that's customer? Right, right. And, you, and you're going towards an ideal state where everyone, you know, the stewardship and the governance gives you that common language around it. Uh, but most of the time, you're not starting there. And even when you do end up there, uh, operationally, the individual places, the business, the technical, individual projects will still have uh, you know, a, a local lexicon that will define that in a different way. And so it's important to have those uh, those roles split out. And then lastly, for the basics, as a, more of a project data steward. The project data steward works with the business and technical data stewards. Uh, they're implementing that steward role within a particular project or perhaps within a series of projects uh, and communicating back with the business technical data, role, uh, data stewards. In a sense, the project data steward is acting uh, uh, in place of both of them. So they're kind of back in, in either one of those roles, uh, but as the, um, as the person representing them uh, within that project. And, and project implies there's some sort of change, some modernization that's going on, some evolution. Uh, m and MA may have put two things together, or you may have changed systems from people soft to SAP, and this is where you're got them focused in. Right, or, or not even necessarily change, but uh, uh, new projects being added, new systems being put into place, and, uh, and that, that steward's role is making sure that within that new or changed system, uh, or uh, in relation to that changed system, that uh, the, the, the governance policies are being followed. I want to note that we're pulling a couple of these definitions from our friend David Plotkin's book, which we'll give a little plug for, and I'm pretty sure Shannon has out on the Dataversity Bookstore, Data Stewardship, uh, and Actionable Guide to Effective Data Management and Governance. But we're not done with the definitions, are we? No, we still have ancillary. These are kind of side definitions, uh, side types of stewards. Uh, domain steward uh, <laughs> would, would be more about a brain. I'm sorry. You're pointing That's all right. <laughs> sorry. Yes. Domain steward, again, across different business areas, looking particularly at integration across multiple pieces right. that are going to come into play there as well. And then an operational data steward is really focused on performance. Uh, in many ways and, and cases. Now, one of the things with all of this, though, is it's not necessary for you guys that are getting started in this to have all of this stuff down at front. We wanted to show you a range of these things, but the general responsibilities do come in play. Right. Certainly shouldn't get to the point where you're saying, oh, well, we don't have people to, re rep to represent all, all five or all three of our data steward positions, so we can't implement this process. Uh, that is not where you want to be. Uh, it is important to follow the, to try to implement those roles and get to ideal state eventually. We, you need to start somewhere. All right, data, uh, data steward responsibilities. Um, uh, on this one, uh, so for all data stewards, they're responsible for the quality control, 
uh, coordination of the other stewards, uh, making sure you're working within a team environment. So, you know, if you are in an environment where there are multiple stewards and you've gotten to that point where either you're in a large enough organization or you're in a data governance system that's managed well enough where you have multiple stewards, you're communicating with each other and working as a team across the board. And just to note, in the Commonwealth of Virginia here, we have a group called the Commonwealth State of Stewards. So state government has, in fact, established this role and adopted the responsibilities for all stewards at all levels. But just like you showed in the other pieces, they were divided up into a number of different functional areas. Right, right. The next group would be uh, for data entry. When data is coming into the organization uh, or into the system, when metadata is being defined and captured, uh, the, the, you, the stewards have responsibility for making sure that that data is, is adhering to the governance policies. That's sort of a vacuum cleaner function. Then once we've got it in there, there's a transformation function. Right, and, right, and that's just the other role of responsibility. Is it's, the same, it's essentially the same, re, same agenda for the steward where they're making sure that uh, the policies and the quality rules are being followed. And I'll tell you a quick little story on this one. I worked for a company at one point where they had a steward that actually put the wrong rule in place and caused the company to understate their earnings right. for several years. Right. That's an oopsie, right? Uh, uh, I've, been on, I've been on a few uh, projects where, I mean, data integration is where, uh, a lot, where this really lives. Uh, you're doing transformations, you're doing ETL, and I've been on several projects where the data comes in, uh, either the initial data wasn't uh, up to par on the governance rules or it's been transformed in the wrong way or it's missing something. And then six months down the road, they find the error because it wasn't found out during transformation. And not only does the entire data warehouse and, meta and data marts have to be backed out for six months and re reloaded, every single piece of data, uh, analytics reporting coming out of that for six months is suspect at that point. The real, Incredible amount of <laughs> cost step back. The real interesting thing that you note there, though, uh, Mike, is that IT doesn't pay those costs. <laughs> right. The business pays the cost. Right. And that's one of the things that we're trying to get people to be a little bit more aware of is not to, to say the average data warehouse should not require seven bills, and yet it still does even today with that kind of thing, precisely, precisely because of some of the things that you said. Right. And then finally, of course, on the data consumption uh, at the end point, uh, not necessarily the end point, but along the way uh, where data is actually being used, um, the data is, uh, should be being used correctly um, by whatever the repository happens to be. It's a lot of guidance that occurs in all of these different areas. And really what we're talking about, it goes back to managing data with guidance. The stewards are the ones that develop and make sure it implements the guidance that is around. Right. It could be as simple as the data steward has knowledge of what that data is, that data element is based on the governance policy of here we've defined this, uh, you know, uh, uh, access point, this particular, you know, uh, hospitalization date. And what does that really mean? And, and as everyone knows, you know, you can look at a single data field and particularly when you, when you start in with the unmanaged state, that could have meant five different things to six different organizations. But uh, at the point of usage, you, the data steward's responsible for making sure they're using that data properly and using the correct definition because they're not using it uh, when they think it's A and it's actually B. So you've got some characteristics of stewards now. Uh, accountable. Uh, the data steward really needs to be accountable to focus on um, fulfilling the, the duties of maintaining meaning and quality for that data. Um, person responsible, uh, identifying when, uh, that there is that official process. Uh, and it's acting as a single point of contact so people know where to go for a business function. We have a thing in IT to say, which throat do I throttle, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? And we don't want to make it sound like it's all bad for everybody, but it right. is very helpful to have this person is in charge of all customer data for right. the organization. By the way, we'll, we'll give you some guidance here. Never, ever let anybody define something as high a level of abstraction as customer. It's too abstract to be meaningful. Uh, you need to talk about current customers and VIP customers and past customers and all sorts of other things, qualified customers. But if you just talk about customer, that's where you're absolutely uh, going to get shot. What's our next one? Authoritative. Uh, not only knowledgeable about the data to answer questions, but uh, having the authority to assign and oversee work. Um, and of course, to be able to enforce those decisions, they have to be empowered with the ability to actually perform their job, in other words. So how much executive support do I need to have somebody doing this? 
That sounds like a trick question. The more the better. <laughs> right. As much as possible. If the boss comes back and overrules you, right, then you're in really bad shape. So it's a good idea to sell this and make sure everybody understands all the way up and down the chain that the stewards are your front line in terms of doing this. Right, yeah, you don't want to be in the position of uh, putting a steward, uh, really anyone in your organization, to have that accountability without the authority uh, because you're just setting them up for it. They're in a losing situation and won't be able to. Nobody likes those. No, no absolutely. And finally, get some personal qualities too. Uh, yeah, and organization is, of course, really important. There are a lot of moving parts around being a good data steward because, you know, the data has a lot of moving parts to them. They, they are a long standing asset. Um, proper organizing minimizes the negative effects. Uh, with, without it, uh, there really can't be, uh, there, there's a lack of trust in the data and in any result results from that data. Of course, none of our businesses ever change, right? No. All stakes. Nice and static. Same, right, exactly. But that's where probably got you to the point where you're having these uh, pain points is because, as we talked about in the beginning, uh, you've grown to the point where the data is uh, past your capacity. Um, so that organization is key. I worked for one organization where I had a little interesting story. I was trying to tell them the value of stewardship. And one of the things I said was that you have a lot of employees, several thousand employees that this organization had. And those employees were governed by a series of HR structures because they were, you know, relatively speaking, important, but customer facing. You know, there's a lot of uh, tribal knowledge tied up with them. And I said, so it looks to me like you have about one HR manager for about every 100 of your employees that you have in there. And that seems to work well. Your employees you're pretty satisfied with and it's working pretty well. I said, you've got some really big piles of data and you've only got three people watching the data. This doesn't seem like the right number. And that analogy worked well for them. They kind of went, yeah, okay, we do have different people and they have different needs, so we ought to have some stewards that would come into play and, and take a look at all of this. Right. So again, authoritative, accountable, organized, good practices to have on all of that. Let's talk about how we take stewards and try to help get them towards what we talk about as a data-driven culture. And we've actually got a little bit of coming out on this later this month where we're going to talk specifically uh, about what data-driven means. Um, but in this instance here, there's a couple of options. Yes. Uh, uh, and, and a minimally intrusive option, uh, it's really about uh, getting people into those roles uh, naturally rather than, you know, forcing them in. We call this sort of a bottom-up kind of a process where right. people kind of say, you know, if the data was better managed, we'd actually be in a little bit better role. Of course, the opposite of that is top-down, right? Somebody says, ah, we're going to do data governance, we need data stewards, so we're going to find some people, and you look like a data steward, and you look like a data steward, therefore we're going to go. Right, the authoritative uh, process. And in the first one, the bottom-up, I mean, that's the, the the bottom are really the people who are probably going to be feeling the pain points first anyway. And so often it will be them that are uh, driving this. Many organizations, however, find themselves in the what we call the two by four category. And that's kind of an interesting one because that means somebody's going to about beat you about the head and shoulders with a very large object and say, you know, the IRS is mad at us, the government, the regulators, something along those lines. This is not optional. You guys will be doing this. That's actually kind of a happy state to be in because it makes your and my job a lot easier. Right. We can look at it and say, well, the government says you have to do this, therefore, right? But very, very few times do we actually get to have that kind of a luxury. Right. That's not, a, that's not typical. It's much more about trying to get people to cajole them into this, that it's a good idea. And again, if you go back and say to them over and over again, data is an asset, you have other assets that are managed, somebody ought to be managing your data asset. Right. Yeah, my experience has always been that you definitely want to be in the position of helping someone uh, perform a change and institute a policy that they have, they, they have been convinced that they need to do it. It may have been uh, handed to them from on high, or it may have been something internally they were convinced. Uh, you don't want to be in the position of coming in there and trying to convince them this is what they should do um, because that's a much harder process. And probably hitting people with two-by-fours is against the law. Right. I imagine. So tell me about this picture because I think you pulled this picture out, didn't you? Um, I don't remember. That might, that might have been done as well. That wasn't yours? I wonder where that one came from. All right. So what is a steward doing, right? 
they are trying to take the policy that is difficult for people to understand because they don't really get the data as an asset, and so they don't realize that managing it well helps you improve the quality of that asset. And consequently, they're going to take the operationalizing role of it. So let's go back to our initial piece. Requirements were what, design is how. Stewards are designers of ways of making data better utilized within the organizations. That's the nature of that operationalization role in there. Now, you talk specifically about proactive versus reactive roles, right? Right. So proactive, you, you really want to build, uh, build that into the system uh, so that they don't get to the point where the data becomes too unmanaged and you're reacting. So the, the matrixes that we talk about here are going back to that formalization that we talked about. Again, right now I know for sure that uh, uh, Jan handles this particular type of data, and that works really well until we realize that Jan is actually near retirement age, and Jan has 40 years of experience. And it's really going to be useful for us to sit down and formalize some of Jan's knowledge into a series of matrices, RACI charts, what her perspective is on the software development, how she works in project planning in order to come up with all of these various ideas. Because if we don't formalize it, when Jan retires, she may or may not decide to talk to us after she's retired. Right. That's the nice thing about retirement, you get to make some choices. And it's not just retirement, Jan could get hired away by another company or something along those lines. Point is, people are a weak link in your chain. And so the more you can do to put in place things that allow the organization to formally understand this. Uh, some of you may not be familiar with some of these tools in here. We've got a much longer version of this where we can go into this in more detail, but we talk about a governance activity matrix in particular. We're talking about who does what under what circumstances. A RACI chart is responsibility, accountability, uh, you know, these types of, of concepts that are in the software development chart. It's that you can't actually use somebody else's data unless you know where it came from and what it was designed to be used for uh, in there. And again, project planning and, and all of the rest of them. And, and the point here that you made, which was that the, we're not necessarily having to talk to them about governance processes, is really just to say these are good ways of doing business. Right. But we're going to talk about them as governance because it falls under that rubric right now, but a lot of people look at this and say, this is really just common sense, isn't it? Right. I mean, it's, it's really just basic processes and organizations to make sure that data is what you think it is. Uh, you know, once, you, once you get to terms like data governance processes, to, to everyone else in the business, that becomes uh, just, you know, almost government-like gobbledygook. So it's good to keep away from that whenever you can. But your point here is also that many people, when they find out that they are going to do data governance, they think that's something done to them. Right. And they become fearful because change makes people fearful right. in many cases. And for the most part, it's, uh, it's things they're already doing. It's more of a coordinated effort than what people are already doing. It just makes common sense. Oh, I already was a data steward? That's really cool, right? right? Then they ask you for a raise, which is cool, right? You want to pay for that, that particular good set of services. So to contrast the proactive, of course, is a reactive. Uh, approach here, which may be that you're just coming about this by saying, you know, we're spending a lot of money in our organization doing what Tom Redmond calls hidden data consumers. And I apologize, Tom, it's not exactly the term that you use in your new book, but it's that, you know, every time we get the data from, you know, factory whatever, we have to go back and improve the quality around it. And because we have to do that, it takes us an extra two or three hours before we can do something else by moving the data on to somewhere else. These are hidden consumers of resources that are in there. And the reactive part is, yeah, we're just going to keep doing it. The proactive part is, you know, instead of keep giving us polluted data, we ought to go back and find a way to make sure that the data they give us is of much better quality uh, in order to do that. The, the key is, of course, this affects the domain stewards in particular who are working within an area, and maybe the cross-functional nature of them will allow that problem to be translated a little bit uh, easier. In a reactive approach, you may conduct a root cause analysis and try to find out what is the precise problem that's happening in there, and then recommend solutions so that you can go back and say, you know, we've got five people that spend two hours a week doing this, and they get paid $100 an hour fully loaded, okay, let's get paid 100 bucks an hour, that'd be really nice. Um, and in order to do that, 
this would save the organization X number of dollars over time so that it does make sense to go in and resolve the issue uh, in there. So that's sort of a bottom-up, bubbling-up type of an approach rather than a top-down type of an approach on this. Uh, but again, either way that it comes out, generally the result is good. And we're just showing these as examples of where you might be in your organization uh, on this. Now, let's talk specifically about how this starts to drive a data-driven culture. I'm going to give a shout out to Gwen Thomas, again, another wonderful friend. She probably more than anybody else gets credit for popularizing some of the ideas in this area. Uh, she likes to talk about big G, which is the idea of high-level governance, and then we also have a little g, which is the bottom up. So again, top down versus bottom up. <clears throat> Top down, I'm going to oversimplify, but an executive on an airplane reading the airplane magazine that's in the seat back pocket in front of them says, data governance will help your organization become more profitable, and the governor, the, the executive says, I'd like to be more profitable, so I should do some data governance. They go around and say, you look like a data governance person, Mike, so you're now in charge of doing this, and you start off and set the policy and get things in place. And, put things out there for everybody to try and work from. Or the bottom approach, which is the one we just described, the reactive approach, would be somebody coming to the manager and saying, you know, I I've, I've fixed three data quality problems, and each one of those data quality problems has made us incrementally more profitable. But if we could attack a dozen of them at a time with a team, we would become more profitable faster in that process. The, tr the key, of course, to all of this is what you were talking about before with that translation between the business. Again, at the controls layer, they may be dealing with fields called Fnertl and Gerk, right, which nobody's going to know what they mean until we translate them up there and say, oh, well, that's customer profitability index. We want to pay a lot of attention to that aspect of, of it in order to do this. Go ahead, Mike. And I think it's important to note that, like almost everything else in life, uh, it's not it doesn't have to be this or that. It doesn't have to be that it's always coming from a, you know top down and plan for that and drive it that way 100% or bottom up. Uh, often it will be a mix of both. You're where they're trying to define policies from the top down, and while that's happening, you have the occurrences that are happening on from the bottom up, and you're trying to, trying to solve those at the same time, and they kind of meet in the middle somewhere. And it's not one time. It cycles through. Right. This is really what you're talking about is institutionalizing the practice in the stewards so that they start to get better at what they do. And if they get better at what they do, their job becomes easier and their results become stronger. So another picture here that's a little bit sort of problematic here, and I don't want to take anything away from the, 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 the picture here, but this is one of those things, can you imagine it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon and you're waiting for people to get something done, and they're going to, okay, now I'm going to walk you through this entire diagram here, right? What really on this is to understand that a policy level action is translated into dimensions by the stewards and that the stewards drive the particular cultural data. Data governance is specific and personal to each organization that takes it on. Again, Walmart is not going to be the same as Target is not going to be the same as Kmart is not going to be the same as Sears, right? There are very different organizations and each one of them is going to do this in a very different fashion. But does the stewards have that knowledge, skills, and ability to take the cultural aspects of the business and figure out what's going to work faster in order to do this? They become the basis for turning the data into the data culture of the organization. A couple more slides on this just to give you an idea of how to improve this. I showed this one before, which is these are the things that we're going to try to measure, and I'm just going to give you the measurement framework here for the CMM, which we're going to apply specifically to governance. In governance, you get one point if you have a pulse. That's a pretty low standard. However, if what you do in governance is managed, it is a repeatable type function, then you get two points. If you write down what it is that you're going to do and provide guidance that you can hand people, for example, that aren't local to where you are, you now get three points. In those managed activities, we can now measure them. And if we measure them and say, how long is it taking? I'm not talking about standing over somebody with a stopwatch and saying, Mike, have you defined that data element yet? Um, but it's looking back historically and seeing what happens on a periodic basis. Now you can say, wow, we took some measures and we're getting better or worse at what we do. This framework is not new. This is the basis for TQM, ISO 9000, et cetera, et cetera. And when you take these two sets of components, the 
data governance area, which has some stewardship-specific dimensions, and we rate them. Now we have a framework that we can put in place for organizations to measure themselves. So here's a group of insurance companies that we did that don't have to have such good measurements. They're just really not uh, helpful in there in order to do that. But the point is there is a way of deciding a path forward how to improve what it is that you're doing in this area. Now, the, the stewardship maturity model really talks specifically about defining, looking at things like business glossary and roles and things like that, and then looking at authorities and control changes. In some ways, it's a little bit like an IT auditor uh, doing this type of work, although don't use those words because those words scare people more than data governance does. Uh, we've both seen that one. And then get into the measurements portion of it. What are we doing to measure the quality of the data? And showing that you realize you're making important decisions based on poor quality data, uh, that you're repeating the data management processes, putting them in place and saying, let's get better at what it is that we do. And finally, enhancing the overall performance of both the data and the stewards that are managing the data in all of that process. So again, just a brief view there into what's going into the maturity model this. There is a nice formal model that you can use, and we're real thankful for uh, the uh, CMMI for putting that out there for us so that we can look at this. One last piece on this, we see this chart or a variation of it all over the place uh, where people will come in and say, here's my plan for doing stewardship. You say, oh, wow, that's really nice. But you know what? You don't actually know a whole lot about what you're doing. First of all, decide whether or not you are going top down or bottom up. And if you are, don't try and plan all this stuff. This is new for your organization. It's a new set of skills. Uh, again, I contrast it with accounting that has actually been around for over 8,000 years. The accountants are good at what they do, and they know that what they do works. We're still learning this stuff. So I don't mean to say that any answer is correct. We know from our experience that not all answers are going to be correct, but that it is much less important to have a rigid plan than it is to have a flexible plan that allows you to move forward incrementally and figure out what those steps are piece by piece as you learn how to use your stewards. One final piece on this that we'll, we'll dive into is something we call the data doctrine. This is sort of a philosophical approach to the subject. Uh, you may notice some similarities here to the Agile doctrine uh, on this. They start out with exactly the same component. We're uncovering better ways of developing systems by doing it and helping others to do it. What we value more is that data programs actually do precede software development, that stable data structures are actually more important to develop than stable code, that data reuse is much more important than uh, completed software in this case, shoot, shared data is more important than completed software, and data reuse is more important than proceeding the reusable code. It's not that the things on the right are bad, but that we value the things on the left a little bit more. Now, this is philosophy, and one of the things that you can do as sort of a test if you're looking at stewards is to look at this and see if they understand it. The first thing they'll notice is that I spelled programs definitely incorrectly on there. I did that deliberately because I want to distinguish that from software programs uh, in, in specific in order to make, pe make sure people understand that. But if people look at this chart and say, I don't understand it, they're going to need a little bit more training. But if they look at this and go, oh my goodness, yes, that says things to me that, that I've been trying to articulate for a while, now you've probably got somebody who's really interested in the process. One thing I, I think of when I when I see this is I really like how another way to think about it is that the items on the left, the stronger they are, they will make the items on the right even stronger. The items on the right depend on the things on the left. Certainly agree. So we've covered here a bit of territory. Again, a quick overview of data management to show you that governance is a part of data management and stewardship is a huge part of governance. We've talked specifically about the business needs for stewardship, giving you some principles and also opportunities for how the stewards really do set the cultural definition of what's going on in your organization. We'll close here at the top of the hour with just a series of benefits in getting a data stewardship program. Because somebody's going to ask you sooner or later, what do you get them? Right? Well, data stewardship's a program something that's going to continue over time, whereas a project is going to have a very definite beginning and an end. The programs are tied specifically to a financial calendar 
So it means it needs to be funded in order to do that. And that funding will provide a better source of the organization. Again, most organizations do not choose to have a human resource program or project, right? They choose to have a human resource program in order to do this. And that this program management is by definition governance intensive, and that consequently is going to give people the idea that from a governance perspective, it's something that wasn't governed before. One of the, the fun projects we did uh, early on, Mike, was that uh, we did governance for the Army. And in the Army, everything's governed. And I went, oh my gosh, something's not governed? We have to fix that right away. Well, it's the easiest, <laughs> easiest sale we've ever done uh, in that, that type of a context. But the programs are going to have a greater scope for financial management around all of this, and that you've got to have a change management program in this. Because if executives tell you to do it and then don't tell you to have some change management associates, it is hard to get people to change the way they do things. So we are right at the top of the hour, Shannon, and let's see if we've got some questions for everybody that wants to talk uh, to us about stewardship. Mike, I apologize for the slides out of order. You're here. fine. Good deal. Sorry, Kevin. <laughs> No worries. Uh, indeed, we do have questions coming in, um, and to answer some of the most commonly asked questions, we will be sending a follow-up email by end of day Thursday with links to the slides and links to the recording of the session. So uh, first question coming in here, who is a data owner and how does he or she fit in with stewards? Um, what would be the critical roles and responsibilities? So I'll jump in and, and say that one of the things we try to discourage people from using is the term ownership of data. Um, for example, if you're in the accounting group, you don't own any of the data that comes to you. It all comes to you from other parts of the organization that are saying, here are the sales, here are the expenses, you know, figure out whether we're making money or not, and can you make payroll while you're at it, you know, non-trivial stuff. Um, and I, I say that in a little in jest, but a little not. We like to have process owners. Process ownership is a key, crucial concept, but a data owner is actually something that becomes problematic for organizations because as soon as it's your data, like we're going to arm wrestle over this next little piece here and see who actually ends up with ownership of that piece. Data belongs to the organization. So that is precisely the reason we use the term steward instead of owner, because a steward is somebody who takes care of it. Again, go back to Mike's example of the, the Disney character wandering around the Disney park. Um, if you haven't had a pleasure to see these characters, they are wonderful. You know, it's a big furry Mickey Mouse coming down at them, making the kids squeal in delight, but they can't operate by themselves. They have a handler there that is just behind them to make sure they don't trip over something or that somebody doesn't want to do that. And also, they are looking for opportunities. If they see a kid that's unhappy, Right, because the character can't see that. The character is a little more one-dimensional, and so that person, that, that steward, is looking to make sure that it's used properly. And one way you might be able to get away from the term ownership might be uh, data originator or data origination point or data user. Fantastic point, because that does give them something that they can attach to without necessarily, because after all, once you use it and it goes to another department, are you still the owner? No, but you are always the originator. Right. Gosh, I hate to and, say this, but you'll always be my first, right? right. You know? <laughs> and and, and what, what is really the point of ownership uh, beyond stewardship anyway? I, I don't know. What would you do with that data that you're the owner of? There also can be subject matter experts, a person who understands the data well. You started getting into the data stewardship role a little bit there. Shannon, thanks for that. I hope that answers your question. If it's not, please do push back, and, and we'll give you some more on it. Yes, certainly. Um, and, you know, and from the same question, or you know, a different lines of business. You know, for example, marketing and sales might look at same data. Uh, for example, the customer in different manner. In that scenario, would it be wise to form council of data stewards? So I'm sorry. The question was, under what circumstances should you form a council? Or so yeah, under uh, so. It, so if you've got dis different lines of businesses uh, looking at the same data, so if sales and marketing are both looking at um, the, the same data in terms of the customer data, uh, but they're looking at it from different angles and different perspectives and, and uh, making this different business decisions based on that data, uh, would it be wise to form a council? Almost always, yeah. And again, that's precisely why it has to happen is because you need that coordination. Think of the parable of the blind people feeling the elephant, right? 
one person's got the tail and the data looks to them like the tail and it's ropey and that sort of a thing and somebody else is holding onto the leg and it feels like a tree. Somebody else is on the side of it and it feels like a wall and then there's the ear that's sort of a wall but, you know, tent leg and things like that. That's precisely the, the focus of those councils is to do the, exactly that coordination in there. And to what degree uh, is stewardship in a federated model viewed as practical function versus a, comp a compliance function? Depends on the organization. So we're seeing an awful lot of organizations that are saying the fastest way to become compliant uh, is through data governance and that they're using that as a driver. Uh, and it's also easier to get money for it, frankly, because uh, the board of directors understands that failure to comply can have serious impacts on the organization. Uh, I'll give you the most extreme example there, the target data breach. Everybody's familiar with the target. In fact, one out of three people in the United States had their charge card replaced because of it. Uh, they went after the board of directors. And in other words, the CIO got fired, the CEO got fired, and there was nobody left to go after, so they went after the board of directors. Well, the board of directors, you better believe, said, whoa, wait a minute, we're liable for this stuff? Absolutely. So that was one of the highest profile reactions that has occurred in there. Uh, and, and so that was really sort of the wake-up call, I think, for an awful lot of organizations to see that. Yeah, at, at minimum, you will have processes and documentation around some of these data issues that that becomes the heart of the issue in compliance. There's a word in the, in the compliance area called attestation. Somebody is swearing or attesting mm. that the data is in fact correct. Because after all, uh, we already told the story about the 5% underreporting sales. Uh, you know, that's a problem. Now, by the way, underreporting is probably better than overreporting, but nobody wants to get it wrong, right? That's the whole point. And we get this next question quite a bit. You know, how, how do you determine how many data stores are needed? Twelve. I like thirteen. <laughs> Forty-two. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Shannon. Yeah, so that's really where it does become personal to the organization. Key, though, is don't go in and ask for 42 right away. Start out small, show that they do good work, and say if we had more, we could do better. I mean, I think that's where you – you get to the point where you suss out business requirements, you figure out what needs to happen where. Uh, you, it's usually better to err on the side of smaller, less, and then as a, a single data store, it becomes obvious that there's multiple needs that aren't served very well together. You can have them split up. Um, it's, it's just so dependent on the unique aspect of what's needed in the organization. And I would also not go in and say, uh, we need 12 of these, right? Let's make it there. 12 business stewards and 16 technical stewards and 14 project data stewards, because you're, you're assuming things about the organization that the organization doesn't even know itself. Uh, instead, start out with just stewards, right? Get them to train that somebody's in the idea. And then when you say, you know, the stewards are kind of busy, maybe we ought to subdivide them up for efficiency's sake and have some of them do some things and some of them do other right. things. It's a bit of a punt, but, you know, you, you have to uh, uh, figure out the, the more exact requirements around it. It's like someone saying, um, you know, I, I need a data warehouse. How much is that going to cost? <laughs> There's a lot of aspects around that. 42. Right. <laughs> I mean, zero's behind it. Thanks, Shannon. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm giggling about 42. If you have heard many of Peter's uh, speeches, you'll, you'll know he's referencing uh, 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 book there. Um, if no well, principles or vision exist for data governance, is it appropriate to begin uh, encouraging the formulation of these, or should this always come after the business case for data governance? So, do the stewards precede the, the data governance case? If no principles or vision exist for data governance, is it appropriate to begin encouraging the formulation? So it's, it's a hard one. I, I like to go back to right now, your organization is managing its data very well at the work group level. But on an organizational level, it would benefit from managing the data with guidance. And the stewards are the people who implement that guidance. So I don't see how you can expect to have the, the sole non-depletable, non-degrading, durable strategic asset of the organization managed without guidance, 
but we clearly have a lot of customers that are trying. Right. They kind of go hand in hand. I mean, you could go ahead and say that there's there's a steward uh, in a position who is starting to do its job, but its job is related to the principles and guidance of governance. And so maybe that they're happening at the same time. You're setting yourself for a bit of a difficulty. Uh, maybe in a case in a microcosm, uh, one small division of a company is can't wait for the rest of the company to move forward on a, on a, on a more comprehensive governance program. And so they say, we're going to set up our own steward. And they are kind of, because they're in a smaller role with a smaller number uh, amount of data, number of people, that they're kind of filling in the role of steward and governance facilitator and, gov and creating the governance policies. Uh, maybe in that kind of case, it might make a lot of sense. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, I mean, the role of a steward is to 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 perform the duties of the of the governance, and if there isn't any, um, there's nothing to do. So they, they, maybe they're uh, growing at the same time. It's kind of a chicken and egg situation. Right. By the way, did you know they figured out that the egg came first? I didn't you know, know that. that. Was, we have to you go look up on Wikipedia and, and get that. But your point is a really good one. We have seen organizations where we'll come in and work with them, and, and actually, the World Bank was one of our. our, our uh, groups that we found this occur, where they didn't have governance and stewardship in many of the other parts, but they did in part of the business part. Mm. And so the happy news for them was, you don't have to hire expensive consultants to come in here and show you how to do this. Walk down the hall and ask your colleagues. Right. You've got internal expertise on this. And that was, that was super. So one of the other things that we like to do, we talked about abstraction before, and I was fussing about the customer being too high a level of abstraction. Uh, all this stuff we've had around the chief data officer sort of implies that that's going to be at the top. And our, our preferred term is actually enterprise data executive, mm -hmm. because that individual can exist at a division level, at a, a group level, and be the person. So if you've got a group that's doing really, really well, then you know put somebody in charge of that piece, and that's where the stewardship will occur. By the way, that's an excellent opportunity in your organization for an A-B test. These guys are doing stewardship, and these guys are not. Mm -hmm. If there's no difference, it may be a little tough to show the, uh, the the value there. I'm going to bet, as you are too, that there's going to be a difference and it will be a noticeable difference right. in the right direction. All righty. And so what would you call a role or individual that can make all decisions about a particular data set? So when you say decisions about the data set, I know you're not interactive here, but let's just put them in place. Are we talking deleting the data set? Uh, that may be something that's a compliance issue. Are we talking about making a copy of it and giving it to somebody else? That may be a governance issue, but it may not be a wise uh, issue on that. I, I think they're trying to come up with a... a yeah, making decisions, I mean, depends on the decision, I guess, is really the answer. If the decision is uh, what's the most proper usage of this data, it's probably the data steward. If the decision is uh, we need to figure out a different way to transform this data and it's a very complex situation, it might go back up to uh, the, the data governance or the stewardship council. Um, it could be that the steward is working with uh, subject matter experts on that. Um, it could need to go back to the origination point on what's the right way to use it. Uh, and that's. It, certainly, the steward would be the first person you go to, and that the responsibility of the steward at that point would be to figure out how do we proceed. Is it something that I'm supposed to make a decision on, or is it something I need to go back to uh, some other person on? What we'd rather see, though, is that rather than looking at this by data set, what we'd really prefer to see is the data as a general class of assets and say, well, let, let's not talk about that specific data set. Let's talk about data in general and you're going to actually have a much better discussion with right. uh, whoever is asking the question. I mean, uh, you know, can I have that data asset that's on your, your laptop right there? Well, you know, there may be some good or bad reasons why you should do that. If I'm going to take it, put it on my laptop, and somebody's going to steal my laptop because I leave it sitting on the right. subway, you know, that's not a good thing. Uh, and if you know I'm prone to that sort of thing, <laughs> you may insist that I, I increase my laptop at least before I send it out there assuming that that's the best you can do in terms of prohibiting me from getting it. Right. Um, on the other hand, if you heard that I was looking for a new job recently and wanted to have that list of all of our customers, <laughs> you might be entitled to give it to me, but it still might not be a good idea. Right. Sorry, Shannon, we can't give you a good one on that one. No, I think I think that, that answered it well. Um, and, you know, certainly uh, the questioner, uh, feel free to 
to, to clarify if you want uh, more specifics. Um, moving on to the next question, uh, we are just getting started with a data governance program and are looking for ideas on how to engage data stewards from our different departments to introduce them to data governance. Do you have any suggestions on how to engage data stewards? So they're out there without work to do? You guys must have your data in beautiful shape. <laughs> well, like I said, they're, they're just getting started with data governance, so yeah. with our data governance program and, and looking at how to, I, yeah. We're, we're being a little glib with that. Sir, surely your organization has some challenges that are surrounding either the data or the business practices. Um, I haven't said this yet on this particular piece, and I know it drives Shannon crazy because I say it almost all the time, but when I look at IT projects, I find that data is at the root cause of 100% of them. And so if you, if you don't think it's a data problem, I can guarantee you it's got a data problem at the foundation of it uh, that's in there. So, so find something that's not working well in your organizations and ask them to look at it just from the data perspective and see what they can do to help inform your understanding of the problem. And if they do, you'll be surprised at how quickly they get involved in business process reengineering activities and other kinds of things that are really the more holistic stuff that we've talked about in, in several different uh, uh, ways around this particular presentation. The, uh, the, the key to all of this is to understand that data stewards are by nature problem solvers and that the more they are engaged to solve problems, the more they will like to solve problems because it's a kind of a self-reinforcing cycle. If you solve a problem, people say what to you? Thank you. It's always good to have somebody say thank you at your desk, right? I would encourage, and this may or may not be obvious, to make sure it sounds like it's data stewards plural in that situation, to make sure there's a, uh, you know, either something more formal like a data, data stewardship council or something more informal where they have the ability to collaborate with each other, have, uh, you know, instead of a code review, kind of a, a data stewardship review when people, when they're going over problems, not for them to check with each other, to, you know, check up on each other, but for them to have the experience and be able to collaborate on, well, you know, uh, Susan in that department uh, is a data steward, uh, fix this problem this way. That helps me know how to fix my problem my way. And uh, that can be uh, a great way for people to engage. I just cheated and changed the slide. So I said all ships need data stewards. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> all righty. And well, um, is there a general rule for selecting stewards from a specific organizational level, for example, specialists, middle management, et cetera? So the, the job category that we gave you here was looking clearly for somebody with a lot of good experience. Um, do you always need to have somebody with a master's degree and eight to 10 years of experience in data to get started on this? I think not. Um, but what you're really looking for is an aptitude, a attitude, if you will. If somebody is bored to tears with data and has nothing, no interest in it, that's probably not your best spot. But if you've got somebody that's, and we get them in, in uh, college and university where they're coming in and they go, I want to learn more about data. I think it's really cool stuff. That's what you're looking for as somebody that's got that kind of interest. They can learn most of the rest of this without having to put in the eight to 10 years of experience uh, in that. And I assume you're talking about a steward who's filling a full-time role as a steward. Because we talked about before, it's not always a full-time role. There are lots of times where it's a, a role, lowercase, where they are a perhaps project data steward. And obviously, if they're a project data steward working within a system, you don't want to bring someone completely outside that system uh, who has no information or knowledge of that, of that system to be a project data steward. That would be completely inappropriate. Um, so, um, but I think in your example, you were talking about a full-time person. Uh, I believe that certainly they can uh, address that if specifically, if not, but I believe that is the, the uh, impression here. Um, uh, moving on, it's, so here's an interesting question. Uh, you know, we are building out and, and finishing building out the, the webinar series, this webinar series for next year. Uh, there's a question here, will there be a presentation regarding IT data stores, not business data stores in the future? Um, and, you know, what are the biggest differences you see there, Peter and, and Mike? 
a great, great question. We actually, as you said, Shannon, are, are just considering what we should be doing with next year's set of these things. And if there's interest in that, let, let Shannon know because she's the one that uh, becomes the gatekeeper in, in scheduling these things. But uh, so the question was IT versus data stewards. Let me put that slide back up there and we'll, we'll dive into a little bit more uh, on that. So as I said before, the real key is that we would like you to start out with just having stewards. Getting stewards in the first place is good. Yes, uh, it doesn't have to be separated between the two or three or five, depending on how you're looking at it, different types of data stewards. But if you, but if you specifically t talk about, think about a business data steward versus a technical data steward, uh, there are some obvious differences there where a business data steward is really focused on more, uh, you know, I would say the requirements and business information and maybe the subject matter expertise around what data really means. And how the data is used by the business. How the data is used, what, what does the data quality really mean? Does this, you know, if it goes over the year 2000 or under the year 2000, that means a lot more to a business steward than it does a technical steward. For a technical steward, what do I care if it goes over the year 2000 or under the year 2000? On the other hand, the technical steward may be the person that understands how to use your Teradata system, just to pick one at random, and really understands the intricacies of how data is stored within Teradata. And so both are necessary at some level of uh, understanding within the organizations. Technical is going to be obviously more technical. They're going to be more Oracle, DB2, Teradata, uh, SQL Server specific in there, and they're going to know SSRI versus a business data steward might go SSRI. SRI, is that like a company or? Right. A... right, I would agree. And I would say most of the time a technical data steward would be close to a DBA or a developer or an architect, but not every time. I mean, they, even if they're not, they don't have to be a coder or, or an administrator or an architect of a database system, uh, but they need to have knowledge of understanding the technical aspects of that. And there are people who kind of bridge that gap, uh, but they would be more technical based. Let's go back to the question that I asked earlier about how to find these individuals. So if you've got a group of DBAs, probably in there they're going to have varying interests in the internals and how data is used. And if you've got a DBA that's a little bit more holistic in perspective and wants to get beyond the strictly technical roles, that's actually perfectly fine and appropriate. On the other hand, if you've got somebody in the business part of it where they're really interested in how businesses and they're starting to ask technical questions, those two, both two of those people are going to be good individuals to dive into this particular piece. Does that make sense, Shannon? Indeed. All right, we've got a lot of great questions coming in here. We've got about nine minutes left, so definitely time for more questions. If you've got them, go ahead and t send them in. Um, so how does data become a part of the um, SDLC cycle? You cannot successfully launch an application without data playing a key role in app consumption, manufacturing, and distribution of data. Most projects focus on the, fir on the build first, so, so how do we make data first? So that's a really great question, and I'm pulling up my uh, data doctrine slide on that because <laughs> it is kind of fundamental in nature. Uh, as I mentioned before, this is philosophical, but let me make a statement that says that the only way a IT project can work from a data perspective is if no data is shared outside of that project or they use 100 percent um, pre packaged data products in order to come into it. So that said, there's clearly a mismatch in terms of the impedance that's in there. And that was really what Mike and I were just talking about just before everybody came online. Um, it is very difficult to do, and we're going to encourage uh, people to start a dialogue at this. We think the website's going to be up in a couple of uh, days on this where it's going to be the datadoctrine.com. If you're interested in carrying that discussion onwards, we're all looking for ways of, of moving this issue, which is a very fundamental issue forward. Um, this is some of the specialized knowledge and training that a steward would have to have is to say, if you're going to try to develop data within an IT project, don't plan on that data being used outside of that project unless you're willing to put something beyond the project into the project. It has to be a program, and that's why I spelled it funny on this particular slide. Great question. Sorry we get real riled up on that one, but it's a goodie. Go ahead, Mike. Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I. I if the, if the data is going to originate in the software being developed, uh, then, I mean, I think from the beginning during, during uh, requirements gathering, during requirements uh, decision-making, during design work, those data elements, I mean, 
thinking about the data elements first, both the ones that are originated internally, even if they're primary data that the, that the business is using, if it's metadata, if it's data being utilized by the system. In all those cases, uh, you think about putting the data first in terms of the steward is involved, the, the governance policies are adhered to. Um, it doesn't, you know, the way I'm saying it makes it sound like it's going to be this extra encumbrant process, but it's really not. It's just about when you're doing those things, make sure you're checking off some of the things about how that data gets implemented and the policies it's being used by. And, you know, structure that data first as a part of that design and, and make sure that the requirements gathering around it, uh, for instance, we want to, you know, have A plus B equals C. We'll make sure, well, let's make sure we're adhering to what A and B and C are as a part of the governance policy is all, all we're saying. Because remember, if you don't get them right at requirements, those errors can propagate throughout the rest of your design, and if you don't catch them until it's too late, it's very expensive. Right. Uh, this is why you'll notice that the data models for most of the fundamental software packages out there have not changed since they were shipped originally because it's just way too difficult to go back and make those changes. And that too late point can be once the system is fully developed and it works fine in that system, and now that system, that new software piece that's been developed, wants to share that information to the rest of the business so that that asset can be utilized by the rest of the business. And that may be the point of breaking. It's like, oh, it doesn't work with everybody else Which is because we didn't adhere to it. And that's what Peter was referring to as being, well, yeah, if it's completely self-contained and that data never leaves that system, maybe one thing. But uh, that often probably, does not occur. <laughs> that, is, that doesn't really occur. And if it is occurring, uh, the, the business is probably losing a huge asset on whatever that data is. Great question. Thanks. You guys aren't passionate about that, are you? We are, we um, are. <laughs> um, so what about data that is not persisted in a physical database? Uh, what comments do you have on managing uh, of this metadata and stewardship? Oh, not in a, in a physical database. I guess we're talking about uh, things like email stores. Streaming, picking up Twitter feeds, blogger Twitter feeds, uh, Facebook posts. Yeah. Uh, so really, governance is about managing data with guidance. If you're not trying to manage it, it's going to be a little bit different in the sense that, um, you know, you're really just observing it and, and watching it pass by you. Um, that said, though, most organizations, even when they say we're never going to store it, they store it anyway. Right. Uh, so first <laughs> of all, I would, I would caution, you know, that most organizations can't resist the temptation because after all, Storage is free, right? Everybody right. knows that. I can tell you what, one of my favorite stories is that I can, I can count off the top of my head at at least six times I've built a system where the requirements involved, we we're going to have an archiving system, and this is how we're going to deal with archiving data that we no longer feel is needed or reasonable. And every single time, once it's all built and delivered, they said, yeah, we're not going to use that. We're just going to keep everything. <laughs> it's like, we told me to build it that way, but okay. But it's, it's so common that it's, it's, everything gets stored. Now, what I would say, though, Shannon, is that you can come back and put guidance for use. Uh, so some of the work that we do is, is uh, interesting work for different parts of, of organizations where they do, in fact, look at things that are going in that area. And almost every part has specific rules and guidance to do it. So even if you're not planning to store it, use, all right? So probably, really, if we we're going to fine-tune this definition that I've got on the, the slide right now, it would be managing use of data with guidance, uh, or guiding use of data, uh, you know, would be another way of thinking about it. And, and so from that perspective, you may have a steward who doesn't actually have control over their data, but they may actually control the way in which you use it. Um, Again, I'll just say, let's pretend we've got somebody's email that we want to gain access to, whether it's an employee or, or a suspected bad guy or something along those lines. There still are going to be some rules that are going to be in play there, and that's really where the steward should be the expert, should be the person who is most familiar with the legal, and uh, let's go ahead and say moral uh, aspects of what's going on in there as well. Right. It doesn't have to be about, uh, you know, this is how we're going to structure the data and the steward's responsible for making sure it gets structured in exactly this way. The, the, guy, the, the governance rule could be we're going to leave it as it is structured in this way, but it is still valuable data and the usage, as you were saying, uh, is the important piece of that guidance at that point. Sure, and, and the questioner did clarify that, that yes, indeed, social media would be included in that, very much so, in that, uh, within that realm. I'll recommend a terrific book called Pulse 
by a guy named Douglas Hubbard that starts to address some of those issues. Uh, Doug is uh, the fellow that wrote the book, uh, How to uh, Measure Anything, and uh, his Pulse book on big data is fascinating in that area, so you'll find some good guidance in there. All right, well, we have just a couple minutes left. There was a um, clarification that came in on a previous question uh, about the role an individual that can make all decisions. Uh, the clarification is, you know, uh, you don't like to nominate, call someone a data owner. What would you call a role um, that can make a fi final decisions about anything related to a particular data set? So I would, I would go for the enterprise data executive as being the final arbiter of any questionable or things out there, just as the chief of police is the final arbiter as to whether somebody's going to get charged with a crime in a town, whether the chief medical officer is the person who's going to make the final medical decisions about things, uh, the chief risk officer is going to determine the priority in which we're going to address risks in our organizations. If nobody's in charge, then the person making the decision gets that role, and you probably want that person to be qualified and, and again, authorized and authoritative in that, that context. Right. Which should be one person. I mean, uh, and that's uh, I mean, w when you say final arbiter, that's really, it comes down to one person and it, it would be, a, you know, the uh, that EDE role or, you know, a chief role. The buck stops here. Right. All right. Well, that brings us right to uh, the half hour. Thank you both for such a great presentation and Q&A session. And thanks to our attendees, as always, for being so engaged in everything we do and asking such great questions. Uh, just a reminder, I will be sending out a follow-up email within two business days with links to the slides, links to the recording of this session. And I hope everyone has a great day. Peter and Mike, thanks again so much. Thank you, as always. Great Thank to you. talk to you. It was a lot of fun.